on this computer. And we are recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New Research at Noon. This is our third session, and we are so excited to have folks who are participating in the Buddhism, Psychology, and Mental Health program. It's only a minor, the program, but extremely popular, and we are very excited to um, have Jen Soon with us and uh, Ellie with us. Um, and uh, we're going to spend some time getting to know them, hearing a little bit about their uh, journeys, how they got to be PhD students, how they got to um, the, uh, the research project they have chosen to um, engage with with their uh, research uh, for their PhD. And it, we will open up for questions in between different sections. Uh, I have three different sections planned, so there'll be a chance for your folks to ask questions. If you're nervous to raise your hand and, um, and say them out loud, you can always put them in the chat. And if I'm having trouble managing the chat, I'll ask for a volunteer. So I'm Tara Goldstein. I'm the new VP at a New College and um, New Research at Noon has been going on uh, since uh, October. This is our third session. And uh, the uh, theme is, of course, research from Buddhism, psychology, and mental health. So we're going to begin and we'll start um, with, um, with Jen Sung. Could you tell us uh, what course you're teaching at New College and, um, and how long you've been with us? Ooh, oh boy. So there's, uh, how long have I been with you guys is an interesting question because I'm actually an alumnus of the program. No kidding, um, that's great. So uh, let's see here. I'm currently the course instructor for New 438, uh, Mindfulness Research, or sorry, Mindfulness Meditation Science and Research. Um, that course, just ended. It's uh, it's funny. The last class was uh, a little bit more emotional than we intended it to be, but you know, I, I think that's the time of year. Um, I'm also actually the teaching assistant for uh, John Verveke's new three three three. Great. And what's the title of that one? Oh, that's uh, Buddhism and Cognitive Science. So I'm kind okay. of in that interesting transitional stage where I'm moving out of the TAing and do actual teaching, which is a little scary. Um, so I am in my fourth year of my PhD. Um, I have been TAing new college courses since the first year of my PhD. So I think this is my fourth year doing it. Um, but as mentioned, I'm also an alumnus of the uh, program and also an alumnus of new college. That's where I was as an undergrad. So um, I've been here for either uh, four years or nine years, depending on how you want to count it. So uh, you have a super, super interesting journey. You started off as an undergraduate at New College and in the uh, program. What were the other um, um, degrees that you pursued? Because the Buddhism, Psychology and Mental Health is a minor. Right, so I have a major in Cognitive Science and minors in Buddhism, Psychology and Mental Health and Philosophy, where my specialties for philosophy were um, ancient and Eastern philosophy. Um, so I took some courses in Chinese philosophy uh, with uh, the late Vincent Shen, who uh, that, was, that was a loss. And uh, also uh, Professor Deborah Black uh, took a couple of courses in Islamic philosophy with her as well. So that was a lot of fun. Fantastic. And um, how did you decide to uh, stay in these uh, areas? What made you decide to continue to develop um, research and, um, and teaching expertise in these areas? Um, <laughs> that's Why always a funny. Why did you do a doctorate? <laughs> oh, geez. Um, you know, my usual joke is that I decided to go to graduate school because I would have been useless at anything else. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I like learning. It's almost a bit of an addiction. Uh, and uh, honestly, how I ended up here was actually just a bit of happenstance. Um, so my, uh, my doctoral supervisor, Professor Michelle Ferrari, teaches New 334 and is now actually the, uh, the interim director of the program. Right. Um, and I was in the first class he ever taught of New 334. And I thought it was great. You know, we got along well. He's... Uh, one of the most well-read people that, uh, oh, sorry, I see a question in the chat. New 334 is uh, Buddhist wisdom. Um, Buddhist he teaches, wisdom. Yeah, um, he teaches it as kind of a survey course of world wisdom traditions and uh, 
you know, comparisons to modern scientific research, to Buddhist traditions, things like that. Um, anyway, I thought it was a fascinating course and we got along really well. Um, so in my fourth year of undergrad, um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do because here I was kind of stuck between the worlds of psychology and philosophy and also a little bit of history. Um, I took a couple of anthropology credits as well, so I wasn't quite sure which direction I wanted to take everything in. Um, I was also taking Mandarin classes at the time, and I kind of thought, okay, you know, maybe, um, I'm not sure what I want to do. There's so many different directions, but there's this Michelle Ferrari guy at Oise who uh, I really liked, and, uh, you know, working with him would give me the opportunity to keep all of my contacts here. Um, no, not leave Toronto. I was born in Toronto. I like Toronto. Um, I know I'm going to have to leave eventually and I dread the day. Um, so I thought, okay, you know what? I'll make a long shot application to his lab at Boise. Um, it was the only graduate application that I made. And I thought, if I get in, great. If I don't get in, well, I'll apply to teach English in Taiwan or something and uh, work on my Mandarin while I figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And uh, through sheer dumb luck. <laughs> or a wonderful CV and, uh, and a relationship that you had developed as an undergrad. Well, I, I think six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, it's funny because I found out later that, uh, you know, they only take five master's students every year for the program that I applied for. And I found out later that I was actually sixth on the list, wow. but somebody else dropped. And of course, the funny thing is now, as far as I can tell, I'm the only one from my master's cohort who's still in the program. So interesting. So, the world works in strange ways sometimes. I'm going to move to Ellie in just a minute, but there's several lessons that um, I think are really important in the story that you've just told us. The first thing is um, you uh, need to do some, some soul searching, some reflective work. Um, what happened with uh, Jen Sun is that uh, he had many interests, many deep uh, studies in a variety of fields, and you did some big thinking about how you could continue um, developing um, some of these interests in a more interdisciplinary way. You found somebody who um, you felt would be a good mentor and you followed them and uh, you took a chance. You had plan B, a really exciting plan B, uh, traveling and continuing to develop your language skills in Mandarin would have been terrific too. And, um, and then when you were put on the waiting list, um, it didn't mean it was all over. As a matter of fact, somebody else, um, you know, didn't want to go uh, to the program at that time. You got in and here you are doing um, doctoral work. And I think what I want undergrads who are listening to know is, you know, an acceptance or a rejection is the product in grad school, it's a product of many different um, factors and not actually a judgment on how um, how suited you are for the program, how well you're going to, to do it. Because it would have been a real shame if uh, Jensen didn't get in, maybe you would have tried the next year and it would have been um, a different set of factors that would have gotten you in. But here you are doing doctoral work and um, and advancing and now coming back to, to teach in the undergraduate program that you start with. So I think when we're applying to grad school, having a plan B is really important. But also, if you don't get in the first time, there are many reasons and they don't have to do with you're not good enough. They have to do with space there is in the program, who else is applying this uh, year. And you never know when um, the opportunity is going to find you um, at a, when you least expect it. So thanks so much. We're going to turn to Ellie. Ellie is um, teaching for the first time in the uh, program. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what you're teaching um, this fall and next uh, winter, and a little bit about your journey. How did you get to uh, the place you're at? How did you get to your doctoral program? Thanks for having me. And yes, I'll, I'll say at the outset, it's, it's very fun to share our stories together because I think those of us who do research at a doctoral level in mindfulness, um, all have these kind of unique paths to getting here. We don't yet have a faculty of mindfulness or even a specific stream on campus. And so I'm always interested in connecting with one another and seeing, you know, what life paths have brought us here, how, you know, what spaces have we found that are open to this research. So I'm also looking forward to hearing more about yours and getting to share that piece. Um, so thank you for letting us start at the journey. Also, I heard your reflection had that invitation, um, I think for all of us to really consider 
Um, if we're going to spend this much time on something, if we are looking at knowledge production, what is the knowledge we want to produce and how do we want to spend our time? And so for me, that invitation of like deep looking and, and really like this idea, maybe that comes from Buddhist philosophy, like how are you spending your life energy? Um, and so it's fun to hear how others are doing that and also to, to consider how I got here. Um, so I'm currently teaching, I just, we just had our final course uh, class this past Wednesday, New 214, which is Engaged Buddhism, um, which is looking at really uh, the kind of history and roots of Buddhist practice around the world, but how they've been brought into our current contextual context um, in terms of maybe off the cushion. What does it mean to look at how this can undergird individual and systemic change uh, was something we talked a lot about. Um, as was just shared, our last class had a lot of feelings in it. This is a really interesting year and I was so happy to see that uh, both the knowledge production and what was being discussed in the class uh, was such a high level of interaction. I was so just impressed and had so much fun with the students. Um, but also that we took time just before our in-class test this week uh, to take a moment to share about, you know, what people were doing uh, over the next few weeks, what anxiety was coming up as a class before any test. Uh, we would, you know, we, we've studied how our executive function is brought back online by calming our nervous system and we would do a practice together. Um, and the students were invited during the test um, if they needed to close their eyes and follow a breath to do it like this as a reminder to themselves and others, you know, that they were practicing. Um, and so that was just really meaningful. Um, I think I shared with you, Tara, a few comments that I had gotten unsolicited from students in the chat window during the, the test session. Uh, technically, it's just, just they can only chat to me privately, but I got just some incredible comments about what it meant this semester to learn together um, in a space that really was informed by the intentions of compassion, of kindness, um, of being able to take risks as learners. So I, I'm giving you a mini lecture now on my course, so I don't mean to do that, but it was just a really enjoyable semester to see how we could bring the kind of ontology and epistemology of uh, Buddhism into a course as something that we could both learn, but also could inform how we were living. So it's just been so meaningful to get to teach with the program this semester. Next semester, I'll be doing new 336, um, which is Buddhist perspectives on current social issues. And that's really a continuation of this idea of engaged practice. Fantastic. And um, can you tell us how you became a doctoral student? How did you find your um, way to where you are now? And then we're going to um, ask both of you about an important moment in your journey so far. So that's to give you a little chance to do that. And then we're going to uh, to think about that. And then we're gonna stop for some questions. So we'll go back to Ellie, uh, how Ellie got to be um, a doctoral student in the program she's in. We'll go back to uh, uh, Jansun for an important moment in your journey, back to Ellie for an important moment, and then we'll open it up for questions. Back to you, Ellie. Well, it's a dangerous question to ask those of us who uh, practice and learn about Buddhist philosophy where it all began, because really then we could go pretty deep into the roots of something and the causes and conditions that have set up a thing called the university, but we, we won't go that far. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe we'll just uh, talk a little bit about um, when I was 10 years old, I found myself on retreat with a uh, scholar, Nobel Peace Prize nominee and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I, father is a physician and my mother now retired my mother a theater director they were interested as a in a as a family how his practice of engaged mindfulness might inform our communication and so this is something that i have been exploring through my own lived experience for a long time um, i also love learning and so i did a master's a degree looking at bringing mindfulness into education. Um, my undergrad, speaking of these weird paths that are odd, different paths that bring us to this research, my undergrad was actually uh, in fine arts. I have an undergraduate degree in uh, fine arts, specifically uh, film and television production. Worked in that industry for a while. I love narratives. I love storytelling. I love meaning making. Um, and everything I learned about grants and budgeting from that has come in handy. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is as I worked in that industry, I saw um, you know, I've been raised with this philosophy, this way of communicating, of engagement through mindfulness. And I saw so much suffering in the world, so much um, how people work and how they live, maybe not aligning with who I wanted to be. So I was really interested in going back and looking at what that would look like from a kind of um, pedagogical perspective through education. So I went and got a master's um, in environmental studies at York University and their program really looking at different environments. So I was looking at the environment of learning spaces of classrooms. Um, and so my 
uh, dissertation for that program um, was I actually went on site into schools, uh, elementary, high school, and post-secondary um, in Bhutan, India, the UK, US, and Canada, um, bringing in mindfulness practices and doing qualitative work around the impacts they had on school communities. So I've always been interested in maybe mindfulness off the cushion, not breathing with your eyes closed, which is great, but also what does it mean to bring it in to inform our community spaces and systems. Um, so that was my master's work. And then this, I went off and spent a few years as an international program coordinator for Wake Up Schools, which is Thich Nhat Hanh's global initiative. Um, but I kept coming back to what does it look like to bring mindfulness in to take care and transform individually and systemically. And I did a lot of work in the sectors of education, healthcare, and business. I got training in Search Inside Yourself program, which came out of Google that brings together neuroscience, emotional intelligence, and mindfulness. And I was working in all these spaces. Um, and I realized that I was so engaged with this work, but I wanted to take the time to really understand the literature more, to take the time to develop maybe my own research, my own perspective. And I realized that in this busy world, I was never going to do that um, unless I maybe actually found the time. Um, and so for me, one of my big motivations uh, to coming back and doing doctoral work was really the space that that would allow me um, to dive deeper into the neuroscience, the emotional intelligence, the practice, and how I might bring that together, which I'll save for when we talk about my research. But I'll just say that it wound me up at the Institute of Medical Science, um, which is out of the Faculty of Medicine here. That's their research arm. I was really interested in how their program would um, kind of level up my, my research mind, my neuroscience mind, and how I could kind of uh, integrate that with my longstanding mindfulness practice. Um, and really with this interest in looking at burnout and attrition specifically amongst educators and physicians, um, humans in our society that I think we should be caring for that really inform the well-being of our society and looking at how I might bring all of this together. So I'll save that for what my research project is, but I'm, I'm homed at IMS. Um, but I also have a second home, which is the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. My co-supervisor, Blake Poland, is there. Um, and so really, again, I think um, those of us who do this research on mindfulness at a doctoral level are always bridging a lot of different spaces. Um, and so for me to have the lens of the Institute of Medical Science um, coming into physician burnout, but then also the lens of public health, looking at social determinants of health, um, and also having that lens of qualitative research that comes out of that faculty has been so informative. So I'm also just really grateful to have found a home that is really focused on research within the context of a university that allows for interdisciplinary connection. Um, and how I found myself in, in this program here in teaching was the former director, Tony Toniato, and has shared for years about what was going on in the undergrad program uh, for Buddhism, mental health and psychology. And I thought, oh, what an interesting intersection. I, I hope I wind up there one day. So glad to be here this year. And again, you know, um, there's so many uh, parallels uh, between both of your uh, journeys. You opened yourself up to many different experiences, many different knowledges, and also, you know, kept your eyes open for who you would like to work with and what kinds of um, perspectives you wanted to uh, work with. And you kept yourself um, open. And it's um, not a, a pathway where everything was determined right from the beginning. Things emerged as um, you began to do one thing. And, and one thing led to another thing. And I think that that's really important for all of us. You know, there's a lot of pressure on undergrad students as they get close to graduating what's next, what's next, and what's the big picture, and what's the career, and sometimes I think it emerges, and if you just work your way to um, one next thing, you don't have to have all of it figured out, right, and uh, and it, it's very exciting to, to hear how you came right to this moment. Okay, uh, John Sing, back to you, and we're going to ask you to talk about an important moment in your journey so far as a graduate student. What a question. <laughs> Just one. Um, <laughs> For now. You know, I, I, I suspect, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, Ellie, making that comment of those of us who study Buddhist philosophy and uh, asking us to pin down one thing. Okay, sure. Would you, do you want to go all the way back to like when, you know, universities started being set up? Um, you know, I'll, let's go all the way back to the Jisha Academy in ancient China. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Jeez, one moment. Funnily enough, I think the one moment that was most important in my journey as a graduate student 
didn't actually happen when I was in graduate school or even in undergraduate. Um, <clears throat> Cause, uh, no, back when I was in high school, I think to uh, the surprise of none of my students who are in the audience, uh, I was a very frustrating student. <laughs> um, I'm not very good at being told what to do. Uh -huh. um, and I also had a bunch of different competing interests. Um, because, you know, this, this is what happens when you're a reasonably bright kid with no real sense of direction is you start going down a bunch of different weird pathways. Um, like, funnily enough, I think for a while I was actually caught between artifact, like going into um, historical law, essentially, like um, artifact law and like who has the right to what artifacts and things like that. I found that fascinating for a bit. Um, for a while, I actually wanted to be a prostheticist. Uh, I grew up around a lot of assistive devices and uh, kept getting frustrated at their design flaws and was like, how can I make this better? How can I make this better? Um, but when I was 16, 17, I, th I think this happened like around when I was turning then, um, I decided to switch high schools because I was feeling rather fed up with my classmates. Um, they were the sorts of students who would quibble with each other about half of 1% um, in high school when this does not matter at all. It doesn't really matter in undergrad either, but it will. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of just feeling burnt out, exhausted, frustrated with people in general. And um, my two closest friends were leaving for the summer. One of them was going on exchange to France, and the other was going to be a camp counselor for the first time. Um, so rather than allow me to sit on my thumbs and get in myself into more existential trouble at home, <laughs> my parents thought it would be a good idea if, you know, I took a class during the summer. Uh, so they found this class on ancient civilizations that was being taught out of the ROM that would count for high school credit. And I thought this sounded great. Um, and said, this was like 10 years ago. Um, and said course, funnily enough, was being taught by uh, one professor, John Verveke. Wow. <laughs> one you're working with now yep 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 uh, I've I've known and worked with him for about 10 years um, but uh, yeah it's funny because this was the you know I, I appreciate my parents and teachers and things like that but um, you know I, I, I was a problem child not for reasons of um, you know, I would get into fights or anything like that. I was a problem child of, to be perfectly honest, I was bright and bored. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this was the first person who I think actually knew what to do with that kind of person as far as how to provide structure, how to provide direction, things like that. And I remember at the end of the course, he called me into his office and uh, said, uh, okay, you know, so these end of course meetings are supposed to be about your grades and everything. And honestly, I don't care about your grades. They're fine. Um, what I'm a little bit worried about is that I got an email from your parents way back at the beginning of this, um, just asking me to watch out because you were a bored, disaffected, and overly curious kid. And uh, yeah, I've seen that over the last little bit. And, uh, you know, it's, I think that's a bit of a shame because I think of everybody that I've ever met, if you actually made a stab at this, you could actually have an academic career. Um, wow. so, yeah, that was, uh, that was the first time that somebody hadn't just like patted me on the head and said, oh, you're such a smart kid. That was the first time somebody said, well, you could do this. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that, uh, that honestly has a lot of influence on um, the sort of teacher I hope to be, honestly. Like, yes. as far as, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not there to knock you down. I'm there to give you the occasional swift kick in the butt. If you can be better than this. <laughs> but, it, but what you have shared with us in your story is how important the right teacher can be and how um, when you um, are able to connect with somebody and help them understand who they are and what they might do, 
it's nothing less than transformational, right? And uh, and I haven't had a chance to meet uh, Professor Viveki yet, but now you've made me want to meet him even more. So I look forward to the day. Thank you for that. That was an extraordinarily great moment to share with us. Uh, Ellie, do you have um, an important moment that you want to share with us? And then uh, we'll have time for two or three questions either via chat or um, if you feel like unmuting, you can do that too. And then I have uh, the second set of questions that will start making our way through. But first, Ellie's important moment. Oh, the same thing. I was I, I was thinking like, oh, if uh, my intention as a mindfulness practitioner might be to be here in the present, and then you ask that question in my mind, I gave it permission to have a little runaround, um, but I had so many come in. Um, so I'm now I'm trying to reorient back and put some of those narratives down and select one. Um, some monitoring and modifying that I'll share for my own brain in this moment. But uh, <laughs> if I were to share one, and there's been many, and there's a lot of gratitude also coming up for the mentors and the spaces that have been held for me. Something I've been thinking a lot about is in this kind of academic exchange of supervisors and students, this time that we're given. I think also I like to bring my mindfulness to that when we start my supervision meetings. I have two supervisors, as I said, one from IMS, one from Dalai Lana. We start with a practice and then we go around and do a quick check-in with each other just to allow ourselves to start the meeting as human beings. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes in academic settings we can forget that. So the thing I'll share from all the reflections I just had was how many like human moments I've had and how each of those moments were like an offering of someone's time to me in a way that is quite phenomenal. Um, that I think we kind of have expectations. It's, you know, part of the split you have of your position at the university that you do some service work. And so it just kind of gets dropped in there. But um, it's also this real offering that I, I'm really grateful for. Um, maybe the one I'll share is about uh, a wonderful professor by the name of Denise Gastaldo. Uh, in Dalai Lana uh, teaches in the qualitative, uh, the critical qualitative for healthcare research certificate and is just this incredible ball of energy, so passionate about what she teaches, how she teaches it. She'll teach us like qualitative research is like the armor that you, your theory is the armor that you put on to like walk through the fire of doing a dissertation. Um, and just a wonderful human, someone who isn't on my program committee, isn't, you know, a supervisor, but uh, whenever I have had a question or need to reach out has just appeared with incredible advice. Um, and she gave a workshop for doctoral students in writing uh, the, the home stretch of writing and what that looks like last year. So I got to go back after I hadn't taken a course with her for a few years. Um, and it was a delight to kind of be in a room with her for one day. And it was like a, the, the idea was come take this day if you're really going into the home stretch of writing and want to think how to set that up. Um, and one thing that was offered and she offered a lot of pointers that day, but something that I actually say to myself, like almost on a daily basis while I'm writing. And I know that it's, it's a one sentence, but I think it captures the the passion and kindness and like fire that she shows for research. Um, but she said this funny thing to us that morning, she had us do a little journaling exercise around what our writing habits are and what are, she called them like, what are your routines or ceremonies that you feel a need to do before you can start writing? And she really asked us to like reflect on this because all of us have those little things like I can't write until this or like, oh, I can't write because there's that. So there's all these like barriers that our minds put up maybe to actually writing. Um, and she summarized the whole activity. She said, remember, you cannot clean the whole house before you write your dissertation. Um, and what does that mean? It was a little bit of internal and external clutter, but this instinct some of us have, which is like, oh, before I write, I should, you know, finish all these emails. Before I write, I should clean the whole kitchen. Before I write, there's like these things we can put up. And I have to say, especially um, kind of moving through a PhD during a pandemic and really like being in my own space to do this. I don't have the library to support me or like these other things. And so my own habit patterns are so alive for me right now. Um, and I'm so grateful for Denise's words. I, I close my eyes and I say them to myself almost every day. You cannot clean the whole house before you write this dissertation. And that can be about all kinds of things. Often it's about cleaning my house. Um, but sometimes it's about like, oh, I'd like to start my conclusion chapter after I've read these five more articles that I just saw come mm -hmm. out and I want to do an extra like bit of a lit review. And it's like, no, you can't read those five articles before you start writing this today. You can read the abstract and be inspired by it. And then you need to not clean the whole house of articles. You just start writing your paper. Um, and so I just, I'm so grateful for her being really open about how truly challenging it can be to write and also asking us to give ourselves this permission to not clean the whole house. 
before we write the dissertation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know um, we have um, our acting director of the Writing Center here today uh, with us, Sheila Stewart, and I'm sure she's um, excited to hear uh, how your um, important moment focused on uh, writing. So what I'm also taking away from your story, Ellie, is that of course our supervisors are important mentors, right? And they actually have the formal role of um, helping us a, um, credential and get the actual degree. But there are other mentors who you meet along the way who you can reconnect with at different times and they end up being really important. Okay, we are going to um, have time for one or two questions and then we're going to get into the title of um, our guest's uh, actual thesis project, what's it about and why they wanted to study that uh, topic. And then we'll take another break. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, implications of the studies. So we've heard about uh, two very uh, different journeys, journeys that nevertheless had uh, some things in common. Does anybody have um, anything they'd like to ask? You can do it through chat or just a mute. And, um, and if we don't have any questions at this point, uh, we will continue with set two of questions. But anything anybody wants to ask or um, um, or talk about, don't be shy. Hi, Hi. Th th this is amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, so um, I'm Sheila Stewart, and I'm with the New College Writing Center. So. Um, and I'm not sure all of who is on. I can see participants' names, but there may be undergrads. I'm hoping so. But also for me, working closely with undergrads about their writing. Um, your story, Ellie, in particular, really uh, resonated at that grad level. And can you just say a little bit more about how that can work for um, undergrads or for those of us who are supporting undergrad writing? Thanks for that question. And yeah, that was something I was thinking also a lot about this uh, term in the course, you know, as a, as a teacher of undergrads, what is, you know, the content of the title of my course, but also how am I inviting that development of some of these skill sets that we also want to be part of this learning journey. And I think for me, um, well, a few things, especially when I think about my writing and learning, something we talked about in the first uh, class and then kind of wove through bringing in the ontology and epistemology of Buddhism to kind of undergird it was really what does taking learning to me is taking a risk and being vulnerable. It means maybe not getting something right. Um, and so uh, one of my mentors also say, don't get it right, get it written. Um, speaking <laughs> of that. Um, but I think this question that I asked all the students to think about the first class that we kept talking about, which is how are we creating psychological safety in this course so that you can ask the questions you need to ask and maybe get it wrong. Um, and so again, thinking about our writing that I had so much anxiety I could feel from the students like probably about like getting their writing right. <laughs> um, and so how do I invite undergrad students, really any learners at any level to consider what an exercise is and the value of that process, the value of getting feedback from a professor on your writing and then letting that grow. Well, also we know you're concerned with the grade and, and these other things that are a reality of that exercise. Um, and so for me also thinking, how can I as a teacher be really clear in my expectations and to make sure those expectations support the students and particularly for writing, um, what is it I know about writing from my perspective as a, as a doctoral student? It's like all I do when I'm not teaching right now is write. I, the other day I was like, I'm running out of words. Um, but I think one thing for me also that was really helpful um, was in my, one of the writing courses I took at U of T, someone said, as writers, we often think locally. We think word to word to word, but our reader can only think globally. They're like the package of the paragraph, the package of the paragraph, the package of the paragraph. Um, and so something I was really encouraging students to do, especially this year when we're remote and less connected, is write your paragraph and then send it to one other person and say, like, did it make sense globally? Or like, take one day, like, don't write it at the last end, like, give yourself that gift of like, make your mistakes the first time you're writing it. So again, just coming back to like Buddhist philosophy of like bringing in an attitude that's compassionate and kind. I think we can really utilize this 
perspective in writing courses because if we haven't trained our attitude um, to be kind and forgiving to ourselves, then we're gonna have paralysis with a blank page because we're gonna judge ourselves before we do anything. And so to me, the philosophy of engaged mindfulness really undergirds the potential to take a risk, which undergirds the potential to start a sentence. Um, and then how do we iterate that together? So that was something we talked a lot about around writing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks Jin -sung? Sung for the question. Do, Go ahead. Jun Sung, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, honestly, I think Ellie did a fantastic job of summarizing advice that I give to my own students, which is your writing is not going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Um, and, you know, especially as somebody who I also uh, serve as a teaching assistant in the cognitive science program. So I would say that I've developed a little bit of a, uh, a teaching specialty in teaching humanities to science students, especially computer programmers, neuroscience students. Um, people who do not write essays for a living. Um, and, you know, it's a very different mentality, right? Because in the, in the formal sciences and the life sciences, uh, each class kind of contains a packaged set of information that you're expected to memorize and learn and be able to do something with by the end of the year. And that's really not how humanities classes work. Um, the content is really more of a vehicle for the development of a certain set of skills. So the way that I'll explain it to my students is, you know, we're not expecting perfection um, because kind of unlike in the sciences where we can kind of judge you relative to each individual class in the humanities, we kind of more have to go, well, here's what good writing looks like. Um, I might not be a good writer. Um, you might not be a good writer. That's fine. You know, kind of like, here's like the gold standard bar of like the most beautiful, eloquent, succinct argumentative writing you have ever seen. Um, but we can get closer to it. And kind of, I don't want to, well, now I will phrase it this way. Allow yourself to fall short of the bar. Um, you know, every skill requires a little bit of screwing up in the beginning. And that's fine. Um, you know, don't, you, you can't expect perfection the first time. You can't expect perfection the 10th time. Um, but you can do it over and over and over and over again until you say, aha, I fell into that trap two years ago, but I'm not going to do it this time. Thank you That's so great. Much. Thank you, both of you. Thanks. We're going to move on to our second set of questions, which is about your own research. And uh, Jan Sung, we're going to start with you. Can you tell us the actual title of your project, the one that you're using now? What's it about and why did you want to study that? topic in particular? So the working title of my uh, my current thesis project, I, I say current because I'm one of those students that I have like three or four different projects and I had to kind of pick one. Right. Uh, but the the one that I'm using is my uh, my focal project is titled Supporting Aspirations to Wisdom in University Students or just Supporting Aspirations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, geez, how did I... Uh, how did I get into that? Um, so I, I think maybe the first piece of context is I don't really consider myself a mindfulness teacher or a mindfulness researcher. Um, I use mindfulness as a variable. Um, that is something that I'm interested in. But I don't really study practices that are supposed to cultivate mindfulness as a focal, uh, as a focal intent. Um, rather, what I am interested in studying is the phenomenon of intentional positive growth. Um, you know, there's a lot of research from like addiction recovery or behavioral change or things like that, but these are more areas of research that are focused on how do we take somebody with kind of dysfunctional or suboptimal behaviors and have them change to, you know, something that's a little bit closer to the center of the bell curve. Um, my interest has always been more, how do we take a perfectly normal person and end up with Buddha? Um, you know, what, what motivates people to go from just functional everyday living to really 
going beyond, questions of the cultivation of wisdom, of self-transcendence, of meaning in life, of kind of, you know, these, what Abraham Maslow referred to as the farther reaches of human nature. Um, farther reaches of? Of human nature, kind of just, um, how far can a human go? Um, and it's funny because, you know, I was kind of struggling around this, trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I study this? Um, cause this is a, you know, my academic background is in things like, uh, philosophy and mysticism of, you know, places where, uh, especially in ancient philosophy and Eastern philosophy and Islamic philosophy and things like that. These are core questions of how far can a human go? Um, but they're not really questions in psychology, where psychology tends to be more about um, statistical averages, population distribution. Psychology doesn't really focus on the exception. Um, but then I was given two resources kind of at exactly the same time that really helped with this. One is um, Agnes Callard's uh, book on the concept of aspirations, um, where... Uh, Callard's work is a response to some work in the philosophy of self-transformation. Um, because the, the, so basically the issue in the philosophy of self-transformation goes with the question of how do we rationally change? Um, and one of the big problems is it doesn't look like you can. Um, I mean, you can change, but the question is rational justification of that change. So one of the paradigmatic examples is, um, how do you decide to become a parent? Um, you know, you can, you know, the reasonable thing to do is usually to ask for advice and input from your friends, but your friends are either parents and have parent values or non-parents and have non-parent values. Um, so there is, there's difficulty in justifying any of your kind of big major life changes in a way that philosophy would consider rational. But Callard's work is kind of a working out of, well, hold on. When we make these big transformative decisions, do we have to use the values that we have now? Or can we use the values that we're hoping to have in the future? Um, so she calls this proleptic reasoning, which is kind of using a set of values for reasoning in place of the ones that you have for um, so that was one thing. And the other was um, a research method referred to as personal projects analysis, which as opposed to looking at people as collections of traits, it looks at people as collections of endeavors. So the workbook kind of asks, okay, um, you know, we'd like you to list a few personal projects. What are you doing? What are you, what are you up to? Um, why are you doing this? How do you feel about it? These sorts of things. Where are you at in this project? And what's fascinating is that just by even getting a small sample of people's projects, you really get a vivid snapshot of what kind of life they're living. Um, so with kind of these two things in hand, I decided to ask the question of, can I go hunting for aspirations? Like if I just, you know, survey a student population, which I have fairly easy access to, what are people doing? Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I uh, that's kind of how I got there, and I was I'm also interested in questions like where do these aspirations come from, right? Like, um, there's again good philosophical work on this, but very little empirical data. So, you know, where do these come from? How are they supported? Um, basically, just questions of. Yeah, what what leads to some people aspiring to greater things? And then, of course, I have the secondary stealth research question that's kind of me as a teacher poking through of, can I give people aspirations? Um, oh, that's great. I'm going to move to Ellie in just a minute. I'm just taking some notes because um, there's so much in what you're having to say. I don't know if anybody else has, um, you know, made this connection, but uh, 
Jensung, I see such a connection to that very important moment that you talked about, about taking the ancient civilizations course and yep. connecting with John Viveki and what he was able to um, help you realize about yourself and the actual subject of your doctoral thesis. And like, that's, I almost have goosebumps because um, something that was so important to you is now something that you're studying so that you can uh, maybe uh, be in a position to help others find aspirations. It's, it's, it's like a stunning, it's a stunning pathway. And I'm really very interested in personal projects analysis. It's not a unit of study that I have heard of uh, before. And I think it's really exciting. And uh, when we come back to you, I'm going to ask uh, you about implications. Who uh, do you want to read your research? And what are you hoping that your findings will help you do? But before we do that, we're going to go back uh, to Ellie. And Ellie, uh, can you tell us the title of your project, the one that it is right now? What's it about and why you wanted to study uh, your topic? We heard a little bit in your journey, but now we'll hear some more. Yes, and uh, again, this is so much fun also to hear. I was like, oh yeah, personal projects analysis. I'm gonna go look that up. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, so my, my current title, which I actually was just emailing with my supervisors yesterday, we're about to iterate it, but we'll, we'll say the working lay title uh, that's from my REB, so we'll keep it for now, um, is Applying Mindfulness to Physician Wellbeing. Um, and so basically looking at kind of two phenomenon and, and bringing them together. So really interested, as I mentioned, um, in the kind of considerations around well-being. And I'll say that this is informed by literature on burnout. Um, we see this kind of growing, uh, growing set of evidence showing the increased level of burnout and the impact this is having um, across physicians as a profession internationally and a call from international medical associations to address this. Um, the reason that I don't want to say I'm addressing burnout is I think in some ways that kind of puts uh, the burden of burnout on the individual or this idea that we have to fix or change something right away, which isn't really congruent with the ontology and epistemology at the heart of my study. So I'm really interested in this idea of well-being or how do we create spaces where we can flourish and thrive. So we have this kind of one area of interest and then the other being mindfulness. How how does this, um, this pathway, and sometimes we think of meditation and sitting with our eyes closed on a cushion for 20 minutes as mindfulness. So I just want to say that uh, maybe we can think of that as a method for cultivating this thing called mindfulness, and we don't have maybe time right now to get into that. I've written an almost 90 page lit review on the topic, so I won't try and do that right now. Um, but what I will say is this interest in these kind of two phenomena, well-being, um, you know, how, how and who we are in the world. Um, and we see in that literature, you know, who we are impacts the people around us. Thich Nhat Hanh would say the way out is in. In order to take care of others, we must take care of ourselves. When we take care of ourselves, we already take care of others. So maybe that being at the heart of my interest in bringing these two phenomenon together. Um, and also uh, having a background in mindfulness-based interventions, but these have really focused on clinical populations, but I was interested also from my life growing up, uh, as you write up this, this interaction I had had with engaged practice, uh, bringing it off the cushion into everyday life, looking at how it impacts the individual and the system. So I was really curious about all of this. Um, and so my research study um, in a very pragmatic way as an empirical study with 48 physicians um, delivered in downtown Toronto of a five-week mindfulness program, delivered two hours a week consecutively over five weeks. Um, the physicians represented over 28 specialties. So we had um, oncologists, family doctors, surgeons, ER, you know, you name it, they were there in the course. Um, we can talk a bit about recruitment and approaches to that. Um, but what the training program that they went through, I actually wrote and designed based on my time uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh's community. I was very interested to my knowledge. Uh, no MBI to date has been based explicitly and solely on the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, lots of similarities and overlaps between other interventions that we see, but the particular, uh, what I'm actually calling practices and concepts. So practice, something you would sit and do like a meditation concepts, uh, maybe things if we're familiar like storehouse consciousness and things like that, um, to bring these together into a program to really reflect what I think is interesting about uh, the philosophy that we come from that really mindfulness integrates um, both practices and concepts. There is both an intellectual exercise of mindfulness and a lived experience piece and how we can bring that together and how community informs that. So the sessions were an uh, intersection of some didactic lecture, 
hands-on practices, and then group sharing and, and applying that to how we speak and listen. Um, so for my research study, my research question is, how do uh, physicians experience a five-week engaged program? And what is the impact in the context of their daily life? Um, I will say in the literature, there is growing conversation around how mindfulness might be applied within healthcare settings to the well-being of physicians, but very few studies have been done. I um, mean, of those studies, almost none have been uh, qualitative or purely qualitative. And to me, that kind of leaves a gap. And what is the actual experience? Like practically, like if we see like movement on like a measurement scale, uh, but where are they actually applying it? And so just to say, I know you're going to ask about implications, but the findings really focus. I did thematic analysis, bringing in a kind of interpretive lens to my work, um, which is to say there can be more than one reality. Uh, reality is dynamic and changing and these kind of uh, methodological pieces. Um, but what's fascinating, what I just want to share is we say in qualitative research sometimes that we co-created the data. And when you're in like medical spaces, they're like, what is this co-created of data? Um, but what really I think makes sense and translates so well is I bring this lens, this reflexivity, and this close knowledge of the phenomena of mindfulness. And my participants, the physicians, bring this close and insider information on what it means to live daily as a physician. And together, going through this program, which I didn't facilitate, I had two facilitators, I was a participant observer, and then doing the interviews, together, our dialogue of those semi-structured interviews, which are my main data for my findings, we co-create what it means for physicians to apply this in their daily life because we each bring those two lenses together. Um, and what's created and what I'm so excited about in the findings is this real illustration of what it means to engage with and to apply. And you know, I have a top 10 list of the places that a surgical uh, doctor versus an ER versus family would do this every day um, because we figured that out together in this journey. So that's a little illustration of what I've been going through. And it was uh, quite an experience to kind of, again, have IMS's rigor and application of applying and doing a really empirical pragmatic study. And then also having that support, you know, from maybe the Dalai Lama lens and bringing those bridges together of those broader questions around what is the systemic impact and how does that influence how this is being taken up. Thank you so much. Um, we only have nine minutes left, so I'm going to go right to the questions on uh, the emerging findings and the, significant of the, uh, the significance of the findings. But if you are thinking there's something you might want to ask before we close up, uh, you will have that opportunity in just a few minutes. So uh, Jen Sung, back to you. I don't know where you are in terms of your analysis or data collection, but is there anything that's emerging so far far and what is that and or uh, what do you think the implications of your results are going to be for you for the world so i think well first i want to say like ellie thank you for doing what you're doing because especially like basing an mbi around a single tradition because one of my biggest complaints about a lot of mbis is that their metaphysics are completely incoherent um but anyway sorry getting getting now into this <laughs> Um, the biggest finding that I think I have that's come out of my research so far is that aspirations are rare. They are so rare. Um, and part of the reason for this is part of how they're defined. So, um, Callard makes a distinction between self transformation and self cultivation. So self-cultivation is basically just getting better at being who you are already. Um, it doesn't change your values or anything like that. Whereas self-transformation is an actual change in values. So things like I want this kind of job or I want to be rich or things like that, those are really just outgrowths of the values and the worldview that you already have. They're not really an aspiration to change in any sort of way. Um, you know, there's an element of mystery to uh, aspirations as Keller defines them. There's an aspect of you don't know who you're going to be at the end of this process. And people who are willing to take that jump are rare. Um, people who want to dedicate their life to something bigger than they are, are rare. Um, but to the surprise of absolutely nobody, they seem to be some of the best people. Um, you know, the people who have taken that leap of faith, uh, cause 
I've through my research, not all of this is going into my thesis, but I've gotten to speak to people kind of on both ends of this people who are, you know, undergrads just kind of starting out and you know, to the surprise of absolutely nobody, the single most common projects among undergraduates are get a good grade in this course, finish my degree, get a job, go to the gym and go to medical school. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that those are bad dreams, you know, those are, I understand where people are coming from with those. But one of the things that's really hit me with this is just how many people are just in basic survival mode. Um, uh, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone and maybe one day you can have dreams. Um, and I don't think that's healthy because when talking to the people at the other end of the spectrum, you know, these are people who, they are quite successful by you know, global measure standards, but they are people who let themselves ask bigger questions, have bigger aspirations, you know. Um, like, there's one participant that sent out to me from some of my data who had the whole, get a good grade in this class, you know, get my degree, go to medical school. But their end goal project was uh, join Doctors Without Borders. So it's like, okay, so you have something bigger in mind than just the, the status or the, you know, because if your end goal is go to medical school, um, I have a friend who's a doctor. I w I've known him through his entire journey through medical school. Um, if that's your end goal, medical school will suck. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, uh, and I'm sure Ellie can speak to this as well. If your end goal is get into a PhD program, that will not be fun. Um, you know, just being in the PhD program is not really the end of the journey. There has to be you really have to care about something a whole awful lot in order to you know, do this kind of thing. Um, and so I think what I'm hoping the implications of this kind of research are gonna be is just, we need to encourage people to dream big. Um, I know it's a big, scary, uncertain world out there, but humanity did not evolve for mere survival. Um, you know, we, we laugh, we sing, we dream, we have goals, we have, you know, bigger aspirations than just, you know, I, I don't know how big we need to dream, but I think if you're not willing to say, I don't know what the world's going to look like, and I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I see the big shining light on the hill, and I want to go that way. Um, I, I think that's important and I think that's enough. Thank you. And thanks for that great question, how big. We have three minutes left, um, Ellie. What are the emerging uh, findings and what are you hoping um, um, they will mean to you, to others, to the world? Thank you for that. This is so much, this is so much fun to connect in this way. Um, just resonating with so much of, of what has been shared. Um, for me, what really came out of the study, what's really interesting, so I'm, I'm writing my conclusion chapter right now, hoping to submit for defense uh, early next year. Um, and what I'll say, what's interesting is my findings are set into five sections, um, which look at the participants learning journey. And I won't go through all five now, but I'll say what the fifth is, spoiler on my, on my research here. Um, but that final section, and this actually came out of the words, I like to stay very close to my data in terms of analysis. Um, and something that came up in my focus group 16 months after the original session when participants came back to reflect on what they had sustained, what was still resonating with them. And this sentence was said by more than one person in more than one group, um, mindfulness becomes a way of life. This interesting piece that when we practice in a way that maybe isn't um, homework or isn't like within like the individual, but becomes this kind of this intersection between, um, you know, theory, practice, application, that we live it in a way, um, that it wasn't something hard or unattainable. There's a lot of assumptions, you know, physicians will be too busy for this. They won't have time for this. They won't be acceptable. It'll be weird. It's Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, like what's this thing? Um, and this interesting piece that really came out, which is when we were really clear on referencing where it came from, on the intentions, on being open to people, bringing all of their lenses to the space and really offering these teachings as teachings, as something that you take up and physicians are good at, they're trained to learn new things and apply them and test them out at the first uh, session. We had a surgeon come in and say, I've been a surgeon for 34 years and I don't believe in this, but I'm sitting in on it. It's a research project. The second week came back and told us 
how he had used the practice every single day because mm -hmm. it made sense when we explained it. He tried it in practice. It was effective. He implemented it. Like this is like, you know, this training that he had to do that. Um, and so just to say this, I think very hopeful thing is that change is possible. We know from neuroscience, we have neuroplasticity. If you say you'll never change, the system will never change. Science has proved you wrong. Um, and so I just, I appreciate this connection to aspirations, which is who do we want to be in the world and what do we want to offer? And just to say across my findings, showing that this practice when taken up and when it becomes a way of life impacts the physician's individual well-being, but by natural extension impacts the communities that they're part of, their relationship to their patients, their colleagues, their administrators, their families, all of it transforms in this kind of effortless way because the effort goes into learning, but the actual like offering of who we are as a human just becomes a human that we're becoming. Um, and so that was quite interesting. And just to note, and I know we need to wrap up that I wanted to just say also that part of bringing in Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings to my work, I set up an iterative reciprocal relationship with his community um, so that they could actually inform the work I was doing. So there was a lot of uh, back and forth there and kind of honoring of different wisdom traditions. So I, I uh, say uh, I have my program advisory committee, my PAC at U of T, and I have my MAC, which is my monastic advisory committee. So I wanted to share that. Fantastic. We are at one o'clock, but I do want to at least connect in a preliminary way to some of the uh, chat. So um, we do have a question. We moved from how big um, Jiang Sung to does it start small? And, um, and then we have another question. Is there a connection between aspiration and uh, wisdom? Maybe we'll let um, um, uh, Jiang Sung talk a little bit about that. But I wanted to tell you both, before she signed off, Jennifer said that uh, she thanked you for sharing your rich experiences. And what she is taking away from uh, your talk uh, is that once practice, the verb in your daily life becomes your practice, the larger inspiration or goal or the bigger paragraph as you put it, Ellie. And that's kind of a stunning way to connect both of uh, your, um, your talks today with us and putting it all together. So Jennifer has um, signed off, but just as we end, we end with uh, a, big, uh, uh, a big question. And uh, Jan Sung, it's for you. Is there a connection between aspiration and wisdom in your perspective? Yes. Um, and you have found my rant button, but I will try to keep it short. Um, current academic, so part of why I got into studying aspirations is because the current academic study of wisdom treats wisdom as an accident. Um, or, you know, basically, okay, people have life experiences and they learn from these life experiences and some people are able to digest it in a more general way and take away wisdom. Um, or there's, uh, there's a researcher at Waterloo, Igor Grossman, who has a fantastic research program studying wisdom as a skill, but he treats it as a very shallow kind of low level reasoning skill of just being able to essentially be mindful, step out of your own experience. Um, and my master's thesis work was actually talking to people of different religious traditions about how they thought wisdom was cultivated. And uh, the atheist cohort produced answers that were basically a match for what science is doing now. And the Christians emphasized the role of, um, you know, you have to have some negative experiences. You have to suffer a little bit. Uh, there have to be bruises and scrapes, which, okay, I understand where they're coming from. But then the Buddhist and the Muslim says, suffer. No, that's a terrible idea. No, you study and you practice. If you're suffering, you're doing something wrong. Study and practice, study and practice, study and practice. And... Um, you know, I was raised around different religious traditions my entire life, and this is a consistent theme of wisdom isn't just something that happens by accident. It's something achievable. It's something you can cultivate. It's something you can aspire towards. Um, so that's kind of really what got me into this is just this idea of why can't we have wisdom on purpose? You know, every, every single religious and mystical tradition under the sun says that's possible, and yet science is not willing to play ball with that concept yet. So that's where I'm hoping my work goes, really. Beautiful. We're going to give Ellie the last word and um, I'm going to uh, thank both of our interviewees in a moment. Uh, Ellie, would you read the quote that you uh, wrote by Dan Siegel? I think it's a great way for us to, uh, to begin to close up. 
Yes, I was just thinking uh, our whole conversation and then the comment on the verbs and nouns made me think of this great quote from uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, who's done a lot of work um, in the realm of looking at the mind and how the mind intersects with a lot of what we've discussed today. He says, we need to stop being isolated nouns and start being interconnected verbs. That's the only way we'll reach optimal health. And I think on those words, we'll, we'll say thank you, everybody. What a wonderful conversation. I hope you enjoyed it, Ajahn Singh, and I hope that you enjoyed it, Ellie. And uh, we certainly enjoyed listening uh, to you and hearing about your journeys and about your research. We wish you all the best. Uh, you're going to continue doing stunning work along the paths that you have chosen. And before we go, I think you should uh, take a look at some of the uh, thank yous. And uh, we even have a little love to share with you. Thank you everybody for coming today. Have a great weekend. Take care um, as we close up the uh, semester. Have a good restful uh, break and we'll look forward to seeing everybody in the new year. Thanks to, thanks to our Thank you. This was stunning. I just, I so appreciate, I, I feel it's helped me with my own wisdom. <laughs> but I'm, yeah. I'm just fascinated by what you're both doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go. Thanks. Say goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. You did brilliantly work. Brilliant work. Thank you both. Just great. Thanks. Great to connect. Okay, talk soon. Bye-bye.